In this lecture, we want to develop the concept of a, what's called a hereditary integral uh, from the, um, the, the quantity creep compliance, which we talked about in previous lectures. So let me begin by just reminding you of, of uh, the definition of creep compliance, okay? So I'll just say, recall, um, we had, um, so for some creep compliance, which we said was j as a function of t, Okay, so some creep uh, compliance j as a function of t. We could write that the strain uh, as a function of t was equal to j of t times sigma naught, right? Where this was some instantaneously applied stress at time t equals zero. Okay, so instantaneously applied stress. Okay, and let's go ahead and call this equation one. So what we want to begin by asking is, what would the response um, be to multiple stress loading? So J of T describes the response to a single um, instantaneous stress sigma naught applied at time T equals zero, what would it look like uh, to multiple stress loading? So let me let me draw what the loading that I'm envisioning. Okay. So let's and ask the question. So what would um, the response be? And now we're talking about the strain response, right? Uh, for multiple stress loadings, this is the kind of the stepping stone. Okay. So let's let's draw a picture of what what that might look like. So here's a here's a graph. This is my stress axis. And this is my time axis. So time and stress, sigma t, sigma of t. Okay, so let's start with what we already knew. Let's jump to some stress, call it sigma naught. And we'll hold that for some amount of time. Let's say, let's, let's say that it, we'll call this first time t1. And at t1, we're going to jump the stress to some new value and hold it for some other time up to time, let's say, T2, okay? And then we're gonna jump up the stress again, okay? And this first jump is gonna be delta sigma one, and this second jump we'll call delta sigma two, okay? Okay, we are in this class, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the viscoelasticity section, we are only interested in looking at linear viscoelastic materials. Um, as I think you've already seen, that doesn't mean that their stress strain curves are linear, right? What it does mean is that we can write the strain um, as, th as the sum of the strains produced by, let's say if we have multiple stress loadings, the strain is the sum of the stresses produced by each, or the strains rather, produced by each loading. Okay, so let me write that down. Okay, and also remind you this is for the case of linear viscoelasticity. So for the case of linear viscoelasticity, I'm going to underline it so you know it's important. Okay, uh, we can write the strain. So we may write epsilon of t uh, as the sum of the strain produced uh, by each l load. Okay, so that's that's an important um, concept. So what does that look like? Well, let's draw the strain time graph now. So here's strain, and here's my time axis. Okay, so there's t, and now this is epsilon t. And I'm not, I haven't specified exactly what model I'm using or anything like that. But let's say that uh, I respond to an initial strain jump, and it jumps to this initial. Uh, sorry, I respond to an initial stress value. And it, sigma naught, and it jumps to an initial strain value and then grows. So let's say it does something like this. Okay, and, and of course this, this term right here, that's just J of T times sigma naught, right? There's nothing interesting there. And this is my T1 value, the same as it's above. And of course, if I now I'm gonna apply an instantaneous delta sigma one, so I'm gonna see another strain jump from here. And it's gonna, it's gonna continue to increase, uh, okay? 
And then at some delta, at some time t2, I'm going to apply that stress jump delta sigma 2. So there's t2. And I'm going to jump the strain up again. So here we go. I, it goes something like this. All right. So let me let me try to draw a picture. If if okay, if sigma if we never jump the stress, we just held it at sigma naught, then the strain history would just continue on in the fashion that uh, the whatever the creep compliance would predict. It would look at something like that. And if if we never jumped it to um, at time t two, the stress uh, the strain rather would continue on along the same fashion here. Okay, something like this. And the quantity, this difference, right? That difference is actually J times T minus T1 uh, times delta sigma 1, right? It's essentially acting like, so this, this T minus T1 just shifts our creep compliance saying, okay, we're, we're interested in now what happens new um, once the once we move to a new time, this just says at time um, t equals t1, we're going to apply that j equals zero. So basically, we're going to ask, we're going to tack on an, an additional creep compliance curve, uh, assuming that there was this delta sigma one also applied, right? And we could do the same thing. Uh, I'm, I would run out of room uh, writing for the j times t minus t2 term, but the, the idea is the same. Okay, so the strain after time t2. So say after times t equals t2, then we can write the following for the strain. Okay, uh, looks like if we just the sum of the of the strains, then we have that first term, which is now j of t times sigma naught plus j t minus t1 now times delta sigma one, and then of course plus j and t minus t2 times delta sigma 2. Okay, let's call that equation 2. So this is after time t equals t2. What if we wanted to write the equation for all time? Okay. Well, we can use the heavy side function to help us do that. So we can use the heavy side function. Okay, if we use the heavy side function to uh, write the strain for all t, right? The heavy side function basically acts like a switch. So it's going to look very similar to equation two. We have j of t times sigma naught. And then, of course, this is only going to be valid. I'm going to write this even though I don't really need it for for t greater than zero, which which is sort of obvious. I don't need to write that, but I'm going to just for um, completeness. The next term j t minus t1 times delta sigma 1. We only want that to activate once t equals t1. So we put the heavy side function as a switch and it's h minus h of t minus t1. And then similarly, we want um, the second term to only uh, be switched on once we get to t2, right? And so then this is delta sigma 2 and then now a heavy side function of t minus t2. Okay, let's call that equation three. So what can we what can we say here? Well, I hope what you see is that I could tack on any number of these and uh, uh, loadings. I, right now I just showed you an initial load followed by two subsequent loads, but I could have n different loadings, and and the form would be the same. So it lets me uh, infer the general form. Okay, so I'll just say observe. Uh, from three that we can uh, infer the general form. And that general form is just going to look like epsilon of t is going to be equal to, and I'm just going to write everything now as a sum and take this sigma naught term as the delta sigma, you know, at, at t equals t zero, okay? And write as the sum from i equals one to n of delta sigma i times j t minus ti times h of t minus ti. Okay, let's call that equation four. 
So this is the general case. I could have n different, um, uh, uh, n different stresses that I'm applying at different times, and this would give me the strain response of applying those n discrete stresses, right? So, um, so this is for for any uh, arbitrary discrete loading that we want to choose. Okay. So it's rare that we we ever want to cre create n. Um, discrete loadings, right? What we want to do is is have a sort of continuous load history. Uh, so we want to be able to write stress uh, as a function of time. Uh, how are we going to do that? Well, what if we were to take the limit of equation four as n goes to infinity, then of course that'll drive delta sigma to zero. Uh, it actually gives us then uh, an integral form, right? So let me, let me write that for you. So let's just say uh, taking the limit uh, of four, right, as n goes to infinity, so we're going to have an infinite number of, of uh, discrete applied loads, and delta sigma i goes to zero, now we can write the following in integral form. This now looks like epsilon of t, and that sum becomes an integral in the limit, and now we're going to integrate from zero to t of j of t minus, I'm not going to use ti anymore, I'm going to have a dummy variable we'll called c, that's our variable of integration, now times h of t minus c times d sigma, right? Which will, I'll remind you, is a function of c as well, okay? So let's call that equation five. Okay, so let me, let me give you a couple notes here. Because of how we've written this integral, when we substitute, uh, when we actually apply t, we see that this, the t that's here, uh, is always um, greater than any of the c's, right? Greater than or equal to. So we'll just note uh, that in equation five, uh, t is going to be greater than c, uh, and what that means then is that we can write h of t minus c. It's just equal to 1. We don't need it in there. And we can write uh, equation 5 in the following form, which says epsilon t equals integral from 0 to t of j t minus c uh, times d sigma, which is a function of c. Okay, let's call that equation 6. Okay. What about this term here? What do we? What should we? What should we do with it? Well, let's use the chain rule. Okay. So using the chain rule, uh, we can write th that d sigma it must be equal to uh, d sigma d c d c, which we could write as sigma dot, which I'll remind you will be a function of c times d c. Okay. Call that equation seven. So then we're just going to substitute 7 into 6. Okay, so substitute 7 uh, into 6 uh, to get the following. To get epsilon of t is equal to the integral now from 0 to t of j t minus c times d sigma d c times dc, which is also equal to integral from 0 to t of j t minus c times sigma dot times d c. Call that equation 8. So what's this equation telling us? It's telling us that if I know the creep compliance and I know the stress history, I can, I can simply write down the, the strain history in terms of an integral here uh, in equation 8. Now, one thing that you might might be wondering about in equation eight is is we have this now written with uh, sigma dot the strain the stress rate inside the integral term, and so you might be thinking, well, this could be a problem uh, for the case where uh, we're applying an instantaneous load at time t equals zero up to sigma naught, uh, because there's a there's a, a stress history that the that stress rate is going to be a Dirac delta function. Um, and then after that, it'll be some finite value. So it's sometimes uh, convenient to consider the instantaneous application of some load 
uh, uh, separate from that integral, okay? So let me show you how we do that. So to, um, to consider an, an initial instantaneous uh, stress, Okay, so to consider an initial instantaneous uh, stress uh, of, let's say, sigma naught, or in this case, it's going to be delta sigma raising from uh, zero up to some value that equals sigma naught. Okay, then then what happens? Right, then um, this quantity uh, d sigma d c evaluated at c equals zero is going to be equal to sigma dot evaluated at zero, which is going to be equal to sigma naught times the Dirac delta function evaluated at zero. So, so if we, uh, we can break this discontinuity, uh, let me say it's initial discontinuity, uh, into the following. Okay, so the, the, uh, this winds up being epsilon of t is equal to j of t times sigma naught plus the integral from 0 to t of j of t minus c times sigma dot d c. Okay, we'll call that equation 9. And in equation 9, this is going to be the stress rate, right? less the discontinuity at the initial discontinuity. Okay, so the title of the lecture is Hereditary Integrals. Um, and I'll just say that equations 8 and 9, okay, 8 and 9, are known as hereditary integrals. Why are they called hereditary integrals? Well, they're named such um, uh, because, as you can look, the, the strain at any time t depends on the, st the stress history for all previous times, okay? So, um, uh, so it, it depends on the past. That's why they're called hereditary integrals, okay? So because the, the, the strain uh, depends on all uh, that has happened, uh, earlier in the stress history. Let me make one final remark. This is actually a really powerful tool, right? It says we now have an approach that allows us to take any stress history and some known creep compliance, which is a material quant a new material property, and actually compute the strain history uh, due to that um, the the stress. So, so this approach. Um, allows uh, us to take any stress, or rather any stress history, okay, I'm going to underline that, um, and um, a known uh, creep compliance, J of T, right, which is a material property, uh, and go ahead and compute the strain history for any time. Okay, so it's a pretty powerful tool. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more in future lectures about how to use this, um, but this sort of sets the stage.